We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming with an urgent request that every person watching this channel immediately open your Bible and get ready to understand it. Welcome to The Way, The Truth, and The Life, a program designed to help you better understand your Bible. And now, here is your host, Ken Wade. Welcome, friends, to The Way, The Truth, and The Life television broadcast. I'm Ken Wade, so happy we could be with you this day. We have a wonderful Bible study we're going to have the first, uh, the fifteenth chapter of First Corinthians. So I'm requesting, if possible, you go get your Bible and uh, read along with us. You'll get a much greater blessing. First Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter, is where we're going to be studying the resurrection of the dead. So if you would turn with me to First Corinthians 15, and we'll start with the twelfth uh, verse. First Corinthians 15:12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. In other words, dear friends, if there was no resurrection on Easter morning of Jesus Christ from that tomb in Jerusalem, it would be, and it was a big lie, there is no Christianity, true Christianity. All the sermons, all the Word of God, all the Bible would be false. Our faith would be useless in Jesus Christ because He wouldn't be the living Savior, He'd be a dead Savior. And you know, in a lot of world religions, whether it be Buddha or uh, Confucius or whoever the leader might be, the uh, Indian religion, the African religions, uh, most of the saviors are dead. So, dear friends, we're going to present today the subject of the resurrection of the dead, and it is based on the very first resurrection, the very first fruit of resurrection which was Jesus Christ, our Savior. And dear friends, if that be true, and we believe it is, it is the basis, fundamental foundation for all of Christianity. For if Jesus was not raised from the dead, as, as the Apostle Paul says here, then our faith is in vain. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Yea, and if that were true, verse 15 says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom ye, if He raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. In other words, if, the, if we say Jesus Christ was raised by the Father and the dead really don't rise, then we're liars. It's not true. Verse 16 says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. The very foundation, the very first one, the very first fruit. And if Christ be not raised, verse 17, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Not only does it affect our faith, but the sins that we thought were forgiven, because when we accept Jesus as our own personal Savior, our sins are totally forgiven. All of the past sins that were a burden to us, all the things we did wrong, when we repent and say we're sorry, and Lord, I come to you and trust in Christ's precious blood, those sins are forgiven. If he wasn't raised from the dead, that wouldn't even be true. So what a sad condition it would be to fall back into the idea that there's no resurrection of the dead. It even includes those that have fallen asleep in Christ. Verse 18, they, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Every saint that went back into the dust of the earth, dear friends, would be no hope for a future resurrection. And then verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope 
in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. So just to have a hope or a fantasy doesn't mean anything. But if you have a foundation, a sure foundation of truth, and you know it's true, and you've proven it's true, and it can be proven as true, then we know that the resurrection is our only hope, and that hope becomes a living hope, not just a fancied fan, uh, fantasy of some kind. We can have any kind of hope. We could hope we could fly. We could hope we could never die. We could hope a lot of things. We could hope we were rich. And, and just imagine these things. That's not true hope. True hope is when you have a solid foundation of something that is going to occur in the future that you look forward to. That's true, wonderful hope. And we have that hope in Jesus Christ because he know, we know that God raised him from the dead. Verse 20, 21 says, we're in 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Read along with me. For since by man came death, that's Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, every single human being that's ever been born on the planet Earth has to die if they're the offspring of Adam, and everyone is. It says, Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own rank or order. Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ's at his parousia or coming. Now, dear friends, this is the hope of all the world, that God, by his mighty power, not only raised his perfect son from the dead, but he is going to eventually raise everyone from the dead. Jesus said in John 5, 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all, A-double-L, -L, all in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good to a resurrection of life and they that have done evil to a resurrection of damnation. Now that Greek word damnation is crises, which means a resurrection to judgment or a crisis. In other words, a turning point. When someone is ill and it's a crisis of whether they will, live, they will live or die, it's a turning point. And in the judgment day, all are coming out of the tomb. Those that have done good will automatically have life. They that have done evil will automatic, automatically be put on judgment, and that's called the judgment day. A crisis day when they will take a turn for the good or the worse. And those that take a turn for repentance, even in the judgment day, will have an opportunity to turn to God and to Christ. This isn't taught in churches, dear friends. For some reason, churches and many Christians hate the idea that there might be probation in the judgment day. But there are many scriptures which show it. That in the judgment day, if people who have their blindness removed, Satan will be bound and they've come out of the tomb and they stand before God. If they admit their guilt and repent, they will have an opportunity to uh, repent, not only repentance, but have everlasting life and be put on probation first. And they'll also have punishments for the past sins that were willful and intentional. A lot of sin has gone unpunished in, for this life. And so the judgment day is not only a day of punishment, however, it's also a day of reconciliation and discipline and rehabilitation. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And the Bible teaches this. Jesus Christ is going to reign over this earth. What's the reason he's going to reign? To rehabilitate all the billions of the world of mankind. Now, what about the, this resurrection? Revelation says in the 20th chapter, the 5th verse, that, uh, excuse me, the 6th verse, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ 
and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now notice, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Well, if there's a first resurrection, there probably is another resurrection. First in this case, we believe, means chief, the highest resurrection, the best resurrection. Uh, it is first in the order of time, we believe, but it is more importantly first in its order or rank. It's the highest resurrection. It is honor, glory, and immortality, the opportunity to be with Jesus in heaven and reign over the earth. You know, Satan and his demons are reigning over the earth today. And they're bringing all kinds of strange things into people's minds. So you have mental, de uh, mental decay, mental hospitals, mental problems, and you have people doing things. They say, why did they do that, that horrible crime? You can't always figure it out because the demons are very active and at suggestion in people's minds. And many people's minds break or crack. The stress and the pressure of the world of some people being broke and hungry, uh, you never know what a person might do. They might just crack. And so there's not always an answer as to why people uh, are doing the strange things, killing people and so on. Now, sometimes there is an answer and there's a motive. But there are many strange acts being done that you can't put your finger on. It's because of the depravity of the human mind and the demons take advantage of that that weakness. So Satan and his demons are very active. Now, why do I bring this up? Because Satan is going to be bound in the judgment day, in the reign of Christ. He's, so he can't deceive the nations anymore. The nations today are deceived. And not only will Satan be bound, but the demons are going to be destroyed if they don't repent. It says, Know ye not the saints shall judge angels. Well, those angels are the evil angels. The good angels don't need judgment, but the evil angels do. And so they have to be destroyed also if they're not going to repent of their way. As far as Satan goes, we believe Christ uh, said that Satan uh, was done for. At the point of crucifixion, Satan went uh, too far. He crossed the line. And so Satan's doom is assured in the Bible. Uh, and there is a point of no return for all of us. There's a point of no return for any demon, for any one who crosses the line, whether angelic or human. There's a point of no return when you've gone too far and God has to make the decision to destroy that uh, person or that being. But the demons will be destroyed. Satan will be bound and finally destroyed at the end of the thousand years. But it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first Resurrection in Revelation 20, verse 6. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now that reign of a thousand years says in verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, actually the Greek indicates when they are expiring toward the very end of the thousand years, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And so on. We're not going to have a study in Revelation, but the point we're trying to make is that the final test of all people on the world in the world will be at the very end of the millennium. That's the final judgment when God will destroy Satan and all his followers, including human beings. Now back to 1 Corinthians 15. We learned that as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So it's very important for us to learn about Jesus and to get into Him and to study about Him and to believe in Him because it's actually going to be all in Christ, whether now or the end, by the end of the millennium, that we'll actually have an opportunity for full Anastasis, that's the Greek word for resurrection or restanding with God. Anastasis means a full resurrection, not just coming out of the tomb. That's resuscitation. But the full resurrection will be standing before God and in perfection. In other words, Jesus was the first to have a restanding in perfection when he was raised from the dead out of Calvary's tomb. 
By the way, the tomb of Christ is right behind Calvary where he died. It, it says in the gospel account that where, in the place he was crucified, there was a tomb, a solitary tomb. And it was owned actually by Joseph of Arimathea and he donated that tomb to Jesus. But out of that tomb, the Christ as the dead body went in. But on the third day, Jesus was raised as a spirit being in much more glory than he had when he was a human being. Which flesh as a human he gave for the life of the world. So Jesus Christ is the first and every man will receive his own opportunity for resurrection in his own rank or order, verse 23, uh, at, at the second presence or coming of Jesus Christ. And then he's, that verse 23 and 24 in, in 1 Corinthians 15 is very interesting because actually it covers a whole thousand year period in two verses. Verse 24 says, Then cometh the end. That's, that's not the end of the church age. That's the end of the millennial age. Why? Because it explains itself. Then cometh the end, and that's the millennial age, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he, Jesus, shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Isn't that wonderful? Christ is going to destroy death on this planet. In other words, death will not rule any longer. Today, it rules over every soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Another proof that souls aren't immortal, I might add. The soul that sins, it shall die. That's everyone that's born today. Whether baby, teenager, a midlife, or old age, everyone faces death at their own hour. And none of us know what that hour for us is. But it's wonderful, it says, what a hope that death will be destroyed. It's the enemy, the last enemy. And so death is not a friend to most people. It can be in great pain. If you're in awful pain, you'd just as soon feel you were dead. But generally speaking, death is a terrible thing to have loved ones snatched away and uh, keel over dead or to lie in a hospital and die. It's an enemy as far as mankind goes. And it's been an enemy since God said, in the day you disobey me, Adam, the day you eat of that fruit, the forbidden fruit, thou shalt surely die. It's a punishment and it's meant to be a punishment. So it's not a friend of man. It's something Christ is going to destroy. Isn't that wonderful? And there's a scripture in Hebrews that said, Satan has certain power, including death. Satan would just as soon have God's people dead. Well, he got Christ killed, didn't he? He forgot and didn't think, I guess, that God could raise him from the dead. But that was satanic. Uh, the religious rulers turned on him, wanted him dead. And that was satanic, demonic. And Satan would just as soon have you or me dead if you're a believer in Christ. That's who he's out to get. He'd like to murder you and me if we're believers because he hates people to accept the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it's wonderful be, to be on the side of God and Christ because Jesus said, He that hath the Son hath life. We have discovered the source of eternal life, even Jesus, our blessed Savior. And it's all based on His death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 27 in, in 1 Corinthians 15. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, when God says everything's under Christ, it is manifest that he, God, is accepted, which did put all things under him, Christ. Does that make sense? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Christ, then shall the Son himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So God has assigned Jesus the job. He earned it actually by his obedience on the cross of Calvary and his death. He earned, he bought and purchased the whole world, all of Adam and his offspring. Adam and Eve and their offspring. 
And Jesus now owns the whole world, not only the people, but the planet and everything in it. And he's going to do a makeover on planet Earth. Now, the resurrection, there's two resurrections. The first resurrection, which is to honor, glory, and immortality for the believer of the gospel age, which may be you if you're a believer. If you're a believer, your hope is in heaven. It's not on the earth. Your hope is to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and to reign with Him over the whole world. And did you know that God is going to bring all out of the grave and you're going to help Christ do that? Christ said, greater things than these shall you do. What could be greater than healing a few people or raising two or three people from the dead as Jesus did when He was down here on this planet? I'll tell you what's greater, to heal all the sick. Raise all the dead. And that's exactly what He's going to do. Isn't that wonderful? Everyone is coming out of the tomb. Everyone right back to Adam and Eve. You know, it's a strange thing that Jehovah Witnesses teach that Adam isn't going to have a resurrection. That's the strangest thing, or at least a resuscitation and come back for the judgment day. I find that incredible because Jesus Christ was the perfect offering that was a ransom or corresponding price for Father Adam. Jesus died for Father Adam. And as a result of it, this, all that were lost in Adam will have an opportunity to be saved in Christ. So Jesus had to die directly for Father Adam, who was the only perfect man ever created other than Jesus Christ, who walked the face of this earth. So Adam had to have a Savior. Otherwise, he would have no opportunity for everlasting life, as, a, as in his case, it would be a second chance. Now, we don't believe in second chance for believers of the church, but Adam, in his case, was given a second chance because of Jesus Christ dying directly for him. And as we were in the loins of Adam, every human being, we benefit by that ransom sacrifice because we were in Adam when he sinned, and thus Christ could give an opportunity for all his offspring by just having one man die for the one lost man that had been perfect. So you see what ransom means? It means a corresponding price. And God's economy is wonderful. It only took one wonderful Savior to purchase all of Adam's human family. That's called the, the philosophy of the ransom in the Bible. And there's a lot on that. We have literature on this if you're ever interested, by the way. We'll be happy to send you some things free of charge. Uh, we're getting near the end and I'll give you an address where you can order more information on the resurrection. Now, the first resurrection is the chief resurrection. That's for the church of Christ, the believers. But there's another resurrection and that we call that the general resurrection. That's the one in John 5, 28, where Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall come forth. That's everyone, unbelievers included, because they need to be judged. The church, we, the believers, are judged now. We don't come back in the judgment day. We are being judged now. There's no second chance for a believer, dear friends. This is it. If we gave our heart and life to Jesus, we are held accountable for that vow. And God will work with us and discipline us and help us. But by the time we die, our opportunity for eternal life will have been ended. And we get no second chance. So we must do what the Apostle Paul said. Make our calling and our election sure and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the good news is we want to be with the Lord as the church, reigning with Him, helping to bless and judge. Know ye not the saints shall judge the world. Judge not only the world, but angels, and give blessings and help mete out the punishments. But the whole world is going to be down here on the earth coming back as humans, not as spirit beings. The church will be spirit beings. We know God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus Christ is the express image of the Father's person. He is a spirit. He was raised in the spirit. He is a spirit being. But the world will not be spirit beings. They will be human because that seed that they sow is a carnal human seed. Paul said to every seed its own body. Those that are celestial will get a celestial body, heavenly. Those that are terrestrial will get a terrestrial earthly body. Now, dear friends, if you'd like to know more, 
These subjects are so wonderfully profound and deep, we'd like to offer you the divine plan of the ages. This book covers all of the major doctrines of the Bible. It's not just a booklet, it's a full size book, except it's done in newsprint so we can send it to you free. We can't afford to send hardbound books. This comes in a hardbound edition, but we can't send that to you. We can send you the newsprint edition, and if you like it, you can later get the hardbound. But this will give you the entire story of the first and the general resurrections. There's two resurrections, one to heaven, one on the earth, and it'll give you hope for the coming kingdom. World conditions tell us we're very close to the resurrection of the dead, so order your free copy today. Ken Wade, P.O. Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. Once again, it's free postage paid. It's our gift to you. If you're interested in studying the Bible and knowing more about God's wonderful divine plan of the ages, and that's the title of the book, The Divine Plan of the Ages, it's actually the first volume of a series of seven books which we think are keys to the scriptures. And we're sending this first one to you free of charge. Now I know that people that don't want to know the truth will consider this like a plague because the truth has always been considered a plague. But the truth is the truth, whether we like it or not. If we're willing to know God's will and we're willing to know God's word, then we must open our hearts and minds to his Holy Spirit to have it revealed to us. And this book will do that for you. It covers the judgment day, the resurrection, the second coming of Christ, the purpose of the second coming, and it also tells us about the, the uh, reasons for Christ's reign. This is what the churches aren't teaching today. They're not telling you that all the world is coming out of the grave, that all the world will have an opportunity to be blessed in the kingdom as well as punished, and after their punishment, if they repent, they'll have an opportunity to gain everlasting life right here on planet Earth. The churches don't teach you that because they want to scare you by preaching hell's fire, living in some kind of torment to get you to give more money to the church. And that started with the mother church. But dear friends, those are dark ages. Uh, theories and lies. The truth of it is Christ is going to reign and make this planet a beautiful paradise and it'll be a brotherhood of man. Order the literature today. It's free of charge and we now ask God's blessing on your life and your heart that you'll grow closer to Christ. In His holy name we pray. Amen. You have been watching The Way, The Truth, and The Life with Ken Wade. If you have enjoyed today's broadcast, please let us know by writing Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. This program has been brought to you by Christian Bible Students and is supported wholly by voluntary contributions. Our address again is Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037.